Silence. It's in the silence. Your destruction is in the silence. This will be BTWRLM291. For all you all on past cast, post, podcast, whatever uh, cast you have, last cast from last week, just get the content links. You can read through where I was starting. And a lot of those links have other links. And what I ask you to do is just search it down. It gives you a place to start if you didn't have a thought, but you found out you want to get involved. Stop the harm against you and stop being an accessory to it. Stop being an accessory to it. So I don't know where all this thing came down through and out of time of man uh, that we were going to be involved in this fight against ourselves, but that's apparently the reality. And until we get to the point where we understand a little bit of that, whatever the psychopaths or the plan have is going to prevail. And so I've asked you to, because we weren't really told about this. Oh, we had some some education, so-called, about how to approach this, but they didn't put a tie they didn't tie anything of importance to it. And we can step back in our, even our indoctrination and we can find the tools that they gave us and bring them forward and focus with, a, on a problem and we can, I believe we can get it solved. And I say I believe that because those are the people that I work with, we do that. It does take a while, but I think that's a problem of not enough people quite getting the, getting the point. And uh, they think they know the point. And we hear this all the time. In fact, I've also been involved with helping uh, where uh, people come with good intention, who truly, they just don't understand. It's, again, it's really just, just take the, the thorn out of my paw response. Just get it done. Or get off of me with your harm, and I want to stop it by doing this. And there's no really understanding of what the dynamic is or what ha what's actually to, to happen. That I've been involved with a couple of, uh, I can say, we end up making them proclamations because there's not not as much force and effect there to, Allow people who think they, who are coming in good, good, good cause and good faith, but really it's not a problem that the, that the government can solve that isn't already given to people. That I've been involved in uh, proclamations that at least satisfied the one who brought it, but really w was, wasn't going to do, do much because there was, wasn't much there to ask. In other words, something already in law that's being disregarded, you don't ask for you don't ask for that again and then expect to be enforced when it, what you do is you have to then have have the origination of the right or the con condition enforced. And that's a different problem. And so we get a lot of people doing wrong things and they cause a lot of work that isn't right. You have a lot of people doing things because they just want the pain to end. You see a lot of these um, state, well, I want to create a new state type problems. The, the information I have and the people I deal with and the people I've asked and talked to, none of them have ever even read their admissions acts to understand how, how a state gets created or what it would take or what the obligations are, what the existing obligations are you're walking into. And they don't have a, people don't, gen, the people generally do not have a, an idea of what's been before them. In other words, even if it, we were going to be making a big quantum jump, they don't understand anything about the fire or the conflagration they've been living through to avoid that fire when they jump out. When then where they jump to? And so there's a, there, there's a fully a lack of actual thought about this. It's really just a response to pain. And we kind of get to get we got to endure the pain while we're working through uh, some of this if we intend to see a better future for 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 people. Now, I don't even know where that comes from, but why why would we care about that for when we're not here? So I don't know. I guess everyone has that, that to ask themselves. But it seems to me, if you have a thought about it, then you must care a bit. And that should be enough to, of a seed to start something. Because it, it can't be that good that you allow crime to be around you, and then that reflects on you. And I don't know if people appreciate this this dynamic. And, and so we have, uh, I think we have some things to do. I was not, I'm not able to go and do what I was thinking I wanted to do. I've never really have. I have finally come to terms about that. And then I finally realized that it was, there's a causative effects that are, uh, co excuse me, causative forces that are there in a number of different dimensional areas. And I don't mean 
esoteric dimensions, although that comes to play as well. Eventually you finally come to that point as well. But we're in the realm of physical, and that's where we have actually a power, and the things that are brought upon us are in a fabricated in ideas and notions. In other words, we talk about all these concepts that we hear people bringing on, and, we, and I tell you there's a mechanism, one of the mechanisms is through this alternative dispute resolution, and it's through consensus, and that's all just a fabrication of a reality that wants to, some people are going to take advantage of you, and if you allow that, that's no different than an invasion, and they win if they get to do it. And they've been pretty diabolical in how they do it, but I've told you that it's, it's, it's addressable. And that addressable is by you being the witness against it, in fact, not in your feelings and emotions, because that's where they, that's they invoke the feelings and emotions. They told you over and over and over from their own documents, these people who use this method, they tell you what they do is not lawful, not constitutional, not, not even in this legal. It's completely foreign to your way of life. And so how do you defend yourself? Well, you make sure you, you at least agree to a way of life that you want to defend and defend it. And at some point I keep showing you that, I don't know, you don't have to accept this because that's just your, your, your choice. But if you watch a crime go down and you don't arrest it somehow, you're just part of that criminal. So I've asked you to do some simple stuff, uh, like get involved on the administrative side of the world that we're living in, which is seemingly driving this thing. I believe I brought quite a few formidable responses to all that, all situated in an objective basis. What I use that objective basis is what most people say is the law. It's the black and white written down that we can rely on, that no one, because it's black and white, and this is the reason why all evidence is reduced to writing, and when it goes to black and white, there's an objective a memorial done to what we're all what the point is, what the subject is, what the what the object is. Not the outcome, the object that to be fulfilled. And then I further found that law of land, the land law in the country United States of America, truly is unique. And that's kind of hard for people to believe because they're all caught in the paradigm of taxation and they don't know how to walk themselves out of that wet paper bag. And so I look past that and I say, okay, what's the way it's supposed to be without that adulteration? To get an idea of what it was supposed to be. And it's still there. And it's there for anybody who looks at it and asserts it that way. It's, it's there. When, it's, when you assert it that way, the only thing you'll find coming against you is the criminals. And those are then easier to out. Now you can focus on that. Again, the objective basis doesn't make accountability it doesn't make it doesn't make criminals go away no the criminal is still there so we got a little bit different work going on and again if you know, my, my, I'm pretty certain about this we uh, we witness crime in other words we just complain about a crime going on we're, we're just an accessory to it and if that's happened against us well we're just a accessory to our own the crime against us we are now consenting in a different way to get at that the silence the non-response to crime and then what do you expect in the world if you're just going to walk, uh, keep turning away from every point and turn of uh, every departure and, uh, of, of crime? What do you expect? But the crime you start to find anywhere, be everywhere, because you just can't now look anywhere. You've looked everywhere else and didn't stop it, and so it's, it's all around you. And so I've asked us to get back involved. And it's really not a, a desire of mine in any kind of belief I have. It happens to be what's needed to be done. And what I talk to you about doesn't mean what I believe is maybe our, my utopia. What I'm suggesting to you when I reference the battlefield is we're in a war, and you better come up with some tactics on how to battle that. And sometimes you have to do some unsavory things in war in order, in order to get the objective. I mean, even if... Uh, uh, horrors that uh, you, you have to go vote. I mean, those of you that have a vote, and I'm not much of a, uh, you know, I'm not the one in the voting, but if you have a vote and you've agreed, because you registered, and you registered as a Pacific, Pacific, particular status, you're all obligated to vote, actually. But because of it's a war, I mean, this is a war, we've had to make some, you know, those uh, compromises where you choose a lesser of evil. 
Yeah, sometimes that does have to be done, but it, that's not done in the absence of another plan, another objective. You move one evil out to get a little less evil, but you better have the plan of moving that evil out to get non-evil. Most directly, you try to bring someone who's non-evil in the beginning in. And that's happened in a couple of places. So despite my, and I know we're coming, oh, that's where we're coming into that vote time. Everybody's got their uh, their black and white view of this. Uh, we, I look at it now as an opportunity locally. You change out the bad for the good or the less bad, or the bad for less bad. Why? Because you're looking to put the, take out the bad totally eventually in the way the system is operating. You don't have many choices to do that if you don't take out the bad. Or you take out, don't take out and don't keep out those that you can identify as the wrong. You're just asking for that crime on you some more. And that's a little bit of an unsavory view, but I, I'm, I'm here to tell you, and as I just re realized now, we are in this time of voting. Uh, if you're local and you have something, you have a, someone to put in office, you better put them in office. Someone like myself can use the good, the good officer. And that, or the, the one that's not quite as trident as the one before. I told you before, I'm not much on this election, but it, if I, if we could remove, uh, the, uh, Obama and put even Trump in, that would relieve us of a lot of things as producers. That was just a private, personal, excuse me, a private uh, objective for my own sake was that we needed the pressure off from those in the, what would end up being a Democratic Party. That's how we can identify that side. But these people were hell bent to bring on uh, an order that you don't understand that we had no chance against that we wanted that we put brought Trump in it wasn't because I'm liking the guy but if we did that it would give us a respite of time to try and gain some ground on what has been harmed harming people at the foundational land level and I have to tell you for all the ones that may not agree with the voting and this uh, oh my vote well if you have the vote go vote if you don't then I'm not talking to that part but if you have a vote, I told you, get it, give it to Trump, not because I'm agreeable with all that, but because that's going to give those of us that are working back in the foundation of law some time that was being stolen from us. It was rapidly removing from us. And those of you that look back, take a step back and look at what's happened in this uh, public land, if you will, uh, con con consider consideration, and the agency's encroachment and the defilement of, of the people and the, and the local countryside and the people of the countryside. It's backed off, just like I was hoping it would. Have we full, seen full fruition? Absolutely not. But together with some people that did get put into offices that were good, and the insight that I bring you, but we apply during the week, that I bring you on the weekend, we've been able to make, it's taken a few years, but we've been able to make great strides toward being, towards being on the cusp of actually, actually seeing this stuff trigger over. Because we were able to get some people into office, we didn't have the we got the people motivated that had the vote to put them in the office. Of better people, we were able to educate that. So I didn't really even want to go off this, this tangent, but the point is, is that in war you have to do some unsavory things. In this case, we have to remove bad people and put good people in. People like myself then can come along and say, "This is how this is here. The black here's your black and white read of how this is supposed to work, opposed to what it's been working before." And when we're able to do that. Things work out uh, better. There's a generally a better sense of how this thing works. And then you then start putting in the things you need, as I still instruct beyond beyond those officers, that you have a private uh, obligation, if you will. Again, if you don't want to witness any crime, I guess you're just an accessory to it. But uh, for those little thi those things that you see you need to make right, I've asked you to do the administrative side. You still have a private thing you can do relative to even the officials. And so we do multiple Multiple things in a war to try and win the war, essentially. And so I'm not necessarily, I told you a long time ago, I do not judge anybody in their fighting or non-fighting tickets. It's just a decision you make. But if you don't, then you give the government, now the oppressor, another advantage. And if you don't, where you don't have really a lot of jeopardy, you don't even test or understand the system enough to be a part of that, um, not a part of it, but a, um, an obstacle to the ease with which they violate everybody. And so getting to the point, getting to uh, the easiest thing and the least jeopardy that I can find is the administrative side where you add comments. We talked about that. I read one that was created by a listener uh, last week. Still thrilled about that. 
uh, there's a lot of work. I'll just uh, add, add this. Uh, now that I was going to talk uh, to that uh, author about timing, don't uh, the the um, the administrative side is really casual. Doesn't mean you have don't have time to time periods that you have to take pay attention to, but it's not like having to deal with the responses in a judicial side. Uh, you, once you put your comment, there's a, an opening, they close comment, then they have to decide. Or it takes them a long time. In that time, you're preparing yourself. So I wanted to point out uh, to all y'all that may go into the comments, you go and you keep track of the administrative side of this. You keep track of that record. You keep track of where the uh, government, where the agency is going within the process. But it's not so pressing on time. And so you're not looking. The government may not respond to your uh, posting your letter maybe for 20 days. It all depends on how hand, fast they're handling and how many how many comments come in. So as I was talking, uh, responding to the author, it may take up to 20. It d depends on what's going on within the in the process. I go try to find if there's a, when they finally post a few comments into that, I would go and I'd see when they were dated and when they were submitted, if that's vault knowledge is a knowing, it, you can find that knowledge out. And then you find out how fast it took the process to anticipate what you're going to see when yours goes in. And, but anyway, it's a lot more casual. It doesn't mean you have to be as less diligent, uh, but the point is, is it's not a big threat, and it's really, really, it can be done in your off time, given that's a, a hobby you want to pick up, uh, stopping harm or not letting government, let it, let it, those, those in government to their own to cause trouble for everybody. And I think, I suspect that as we get more practiced in that, the more difficult things start to become a little bit more knowledgeable. Sitting on the sidelines, you'll never understand what I'm talking about. And I can just guarantee that to you. You'll, you'll never understand what I'm saying, and you'll be able to hold, you'll be able to believe you can hold on to your own opinions about what I'm saying if you're in the contrary part of it. And, and that's just they're not going to work. So I'll just point out as we follow through. I said that this this uh, point about uh, I, I think I mentioned uh, on the air on the air here. I think I said. And uh, again, relative to this cannabis uh, issue, and for me, it's really watching the medicinal. Uh, help and value of it for people as they self choose self medicate if I can say that uh, that it's being destroyed in you and then monopolized by the government agencies that I've asked uh, for those of you that are interested to step in and, and do what you can a, an author last week uh, or before we could go to a week and a half ago made a comment uh, made a discussion of it last week well and I said right before that some weeks ago before that I said this is I think the right time in history regarding cannabis for all the propaganda, negative propaganda that's been going on for 40, 50 years, this is probably the right time in history that I think if you get in this one, not only do you have little jeopardy, but you're going to have a likelihood of, of having a success. And because there's going to be lots of avenues to throw uh, the anomalies, the oxymoronic condition on to the agency that has to make the decision based on how I understand the administrative procedures are and the requirements on those procedures against the agency. That we heard, as I, we heard the uh, quite quite a weeks ago, that uh, even though there's a, an international agreement regarding cannabis or marijuana, and again they've commingled those two terms, so there's really no use to try and split the hairs. Just in a general conversation, you might be able to do it in more specific, as we would hemp, uh, and 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 so we could you could do that, but it's just going to take more. Is is uh, we found out even though there's an international agreement that two countries decided they weren't going to participate. In particular, we reported I think last week Canada has opted out, and we're going to do now uh, what they call recreational uh, and or medicinal marijuana. But I told you, watch out! They legalize it, you're not registered, and you're going to be registered and tracked about how you do that. So that's a legalization problem, right? And I said, don't do that. Don't decriminalize. It makes it sound like, oh, you can't. What do you mean, don't legalize? Oh, what do you mean, don't don't decriminalize? Yeah, just get off of the weed, free the weed. Just get off of the regulation. And now, guess what? Think over, look around the world. Is there's nothing going on? Well, the world has decided in the UN and the WHO, not the OWL, not the Rock Group, but the WHO, the World Health Organization, has decided to condemn cannabis. And there's been international agreements of, that we will abstain or that it will recognize it as a harmful drug. And then we found two countries that didn't agree. Well, I told you you're on the right side of, on the history here. Uh, as we now see, Mexico's Supreme Court says ban on recreational marijuana is unconstitutional. And so here's another country that is going to go against the, at least their judiciary. And I would use it this way. Notwithstanding what we say about the rule of law, we go ahead and use the, the authorities that take, we can take advantage of, even though, to me, this shouldn't even have to been said. And if you look closely, it's actually not been said correctly, 
But for our purposes internationally, and what the author was writing to last week, or the week before that, was an international sense that here's another country that's not believing that agreement. Something's amiss in this perception that uh, they've said that you can, no recreational. Well, that's interesting. And I, again, I, I have a problem with this word recreational. Uh, what about just private use? How about we just go to private use? Forget the rec, whoever came up with that didn't, uh, people didn't understand the double speak that that meant. And di people didn't understand that, that, that they trivialized it in order to uh, get people to agree it's something to do. See, what well, your private use has nothing to do with uh, putting a title on it. So I would say we would advocate against this recreational. When they get it into recreational, they now create it into a, a tri almost trivial use. And so they get to continue to watch the regulation, which happens in this decision. But anyway, the, the cover of this is me me now Mexico's stepping back. Judicially, they can't even ban an absolute ban. See, here's what they start to do. That's how they did it to the miners. Oh, we can regulate a little bit. There can't be an absolute ban, like on your guns. There can't be an absolute ban. But we can regulate it up until the point where the courts finally say, oh, that was a, that partial ban was enough to be absolute. So you, you, you get them meddling. You gotta stop them, allow them from meddling. And in Mexico, I don't know what their land law is, uh, uh, so I don't know how they could do this, as I was suggesting to you, production. But on production side, non-commerce production, it's not recreational what you do. It's part of the production of land. It's actually a lot of work. And it's work for a, a an investment the man or woman puts in. His his or her life is invested in this. So you start to understand how to describe this a little differently. You get it off of the, you, you, you take it off the fork of the commerce side, which they want to keep doing. This diminishing this regulation by or this uh, rec or characterization of recreational trivializes all this. And but even so, they say absolute bans on recreational use are unconstitutional. So how can that agreement, that the international agreement that the author spoke to last week here behind which that I read to you, how can that, um, how can the point challenging the international agreement for being problematic where two other countries have found it to be irrelevant to what they need and now we get a third one, how, how can that be valid? How can they cause this to not have a meaning and a purpose when now even recreational is Obstruction is unconstitutional. How can they enter? How can the countries enter into agreements that are unconscionable to the to the Constitution? As I told you last week, they cannot make these agreements or treaties a violation of the Constitution. What they do is they make these these these, these agreements and treaties, and no one says they're a violation or challenges them. No one steps up. So announcing it had found in favor of two legal challenges filed against prohibition of recreational marijuana use. Mexico's top court crossed the threshold needed to create jurisprudence, five similar rulings on the matter that create a president in the Mexican courts who will have to follow here. The historic, this is a historic day, Fernando Balanzaran, an advocate for drug reform and member of the opposition leftist party and the Democratic Revolution, PRD, said, the Supreme Court made its first ruling to allow a group of people to grow marijuana for personal use in November 2015, I think I reported that behind the woodshed, in a statement that this is a follow-up decision. In the statement, the court said the ruling did not create an absolute right to use marijuana and that a consumption of certain substances could still be subject to regulation. But the effect caused by marijuana does not justify an absolute prohibition on its consumption, it said. The court ordered federal health regulator, C-O-F-E-R-R-R-P-I-S, to authorize people, authorize people seeking the right to use to do so personally, quote, albeit without allowing them to market it or use other narcotics or psychotropic drugs. Well, those narcotics were the ones that were legally authorized that we saw cause problems when people use cannabis together with it, isn't it? So that was pretty fair. But remember here, they albeit without allowing them to market it. Well, I told you what, all producers, all farmers have right from farm to market in the United States, so this would violate that provision. So you start piecing this apart of what happens in other countries relative to American land laws, and you're going to find, uh, United States of America land laws, and you're going to find out that this uh, can't hold up for personal. But see, personal is in the context of business. 
And so we have a, I can parse this out pretty well. I don't want to waste a lot of time here for people that aren't interested, but I want to, I'm just trying to talk to you here to let you know, have an, here, here's an insight on how you parse this through to see a foreign country is even letting so-called recreational through. But they preface it on this, it's on a commerce side. And I'm asking you all to, anyone that wants to engage, engage it on also, bring up the production side, particularly United States of America with well, when the patent you show as evidence, it doesn't have a reservation against the production of hemp. At least hemp. Anyway, so I guess there's enough here. Uh, I'm not, uh, again, I'm not promoting any of this. This is a plant. Get off the plant. Stop legalizing decrum. Stop it. Just get on to something more important now. People are finding use in it, uh, notwithstanding what the officials, experts say, which we then can tie to corruption and infighting in the revolving door, at least in the United States of America, of the of the agencies who can't make up their mind whether it's got a medicinal value or not, but then make legal monopolies in derivative synthetics. Think about all this. And we sent crickets to this. It just blows me away. How, how much easier? It's not even an argument. If we just laid out the facts. Like I hear lots of people can do in the chats. They do it. They just don't apply it in the right spot. You talk in the chat instead of on a piece of paper and send it to the right the right one to give you standing to take all you know and, and apply it against someone who's trying to get uh, trying to make a crime against everybody everybody not just you and then those of us that I, I don't have a lot of things to do I'd get involved with stuff I, I have no interest in a lot of this stuff I got too busy with what I have but I'll still make a an attempt to give some uh, uh, guidance uh, at least to get somebody to do to be able to do something that I can't do and here we have a, we could work together no we don't we rather argue amongst each other. So anyway, uh, for maybe in particular, you can't do this on last week's uh, comment, but you hold it back. You say, okay, you had two, and then when it might come, it may come up. You can actually say, well, in the meantime, now Mexico is now re recreational. The problem is, let me go and highlight some of my, uh, again, I can point all this stuff out as I go, but remember, the one who promoted this was an advocate for drug reform. When you have that one, that one advocating for drug reform on on cannabis, are you ever going to have that guy remove it from from a drug scheduling? Likely not. And this is the problem I keep pointing out. You got to be careful on who becomes an advocate for what, and then why, and then the underpinnings. So as I was comment, commenting to someone about the an or, a meter uh, fee opt out charge or a, a, re, a meter reading fee, I said you can't argue about the fee. You have to go into the rules, the American, uh, excuse me, the uh, Administrative Procedures Act, and you have to find where they violated a provision of that act, and you speak from the fact that they violated the provision of the act, and so you don't agree to they have a right to have the fee. Because when you go argue the fee, and you don't argue that they were not supposed to impose the meter because they violated the rule, then you agree they had the right to put the meter in. You have to think this thing back through. Everyone wants to go, oh, I critically think, I'd use the trivium. Nonsense. No one does anything. They just talk about it. You got to keep stepping yourself back to the foundation of this discussion, the point. And when you do that, you, you you have to leave behind the commerce regulation authority of the of the government. Now the government's gone. I don't know if people understand this. You want to get rid of government? Get outside of its authority. It doesn't exist there. That's how you disappear the state. People don't get this. They think I'm talking about engaging the state and and promoting it. You, you haven't got the concept. Get outside of what it can regulate, and the government disappears relative to you. Is that clear enough? Does that excite anybody that they might try to work toward understanding that, and then how to effectuate that? And then if we all got together and understood how to make the government irrelevant because it can't do certain things, as I've told you before, even through the miners, well, there's a rule prohibiting the delegation authority to close a road against a miner. The government's irrelevant. The government just disappeared there. Have you not heard it that way in your mind? If you hadn't, here it is today, because it just came to me to tell you. That's how you disappear the government. But you're not going to do it being cricket. So, getting back to the point, uh, the marijuana, uh, we're on the right side of history here. It's devolving down, and I'm not so focused on this, but people might be. And so I offer this, and I think it's the uh, easy way, an easy way to discuss uh, how to approach the administrative side of this and to defeat that thing called government relative to the uh, in, the administrative impositions that are pervasive against us today. And so you can't 
argue through someone representing uh, a drug reform when my position would be it's not a drug at all, as I said before. It's a production uh, power that you have in the land, pertinent to land. Oh, there's that word again that no one seems to understand, a pertinent. And so, and then you're going to have a little bit more. That's not, not the answer. I'll give you the nutshell. You know, someone's going to, someone who wants to keep control is going to have something to say. And that's why you can't give that one the right to say it. So you stand in the way of it by saying that there's laws like we did, like I just gave the example. Well, you don't even have, as a Forest Service agent, you don't have a right to discuss with me the closing out of the, uh, you don't have a delegation power to, sh to even have a discussion about the highways relative to my use. Poof, the state is gone. Now all you're looking for is whether that one's going to be a criminal. And so there's a certain process that you respond about these things. In the meters, like I said, in the meters, the, the uh, uh, fee to come and read it, you can't argue that. You have to go argue that the uh, the, 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 the PUC, the, the Public Utilities Commission of your state, didn't follow the administrative procedures to get to the point that they could uh, even decide the point of the fee reading fee. No, you challenge that they even had a right to have the project implement. Why? Because they didn't do, and they didn't look at the constitutional provisions. And there's at this time you'll find out because they use the alternative dispute resolution condition, they violated the point where they didn't uh, look at the prohibitions, and there's no record about that. That's where you get them. The fact that they're coming in a second and third time to discuss two and three things that shouldn't have been going on that as the public, uh, the public generally, the people and the companies get together and they start seeing a problem in it, shows it's a facial evidence that they didn't follow the pre process, the proceeding, the law correctly in the proceeding. That's all you have to say. The fact that we're here commenting on this after there's been a decision made shows that the decision's invalid underneath the law. Is that so hard for to do, folks, really? Well, it isn't, but people want to make excuses. And until I think we get into this understanding on how this works, we're not prepared in our day-to-day -day, um, uh, addressments of just about anything to, to deal with a whole lot. And I'm talking more official, not, not, not casual between us. But even so, then it might get rid of a lot of nonsense discussion, I see. But uh, officially, and those that want to create the authority that they have official officialness, then you can cut right through it. You don't argue about a fee when no one had the right to impose the meter. Or, there's no record showing that way, which is another thing you ask about. Well, you, just, you don't ask about it. You, you assert the record doesn't show the authority that allows the, the commission to do this. Uh, same thing here. The, when you write to the agency, the FDA, you just hold out because, like in the last authorship, you know, you just say, we're saying that you don't have the authority to do this. In fact, your record shows you don't quite get the whole, you're not quite putting the picture together. You've got so many so many conundrums about us, so oxymorons, some incongruities about all this, you can't possibly be doing this correctly. Why is that not so hard to say? And so, uh, getting back over here, Mexico's now stepped up and said even recreational is, uh, is regulable but not prohibited. It's the same nonsense that the uh, minor is now subject to, where he allows a representative called an attorney to to, for, to uh, induce him into filing an application for uh, some notice of in, by by notice of intent and then some plan of operations. It doesn't exist in law. You invite the you invite Dracula into your house. I'm asking you to listen to what I'm saying behind the woodshed, learn the principle, and how stop doing that in your life. The only thing I can relate to is the things I do that I can give you anecdotally, how that works for you. Otherwise, it's not applicable. But I don't know what else to do. So we're going to have to, you're going to have to work a little bit to understand what I'm saying. And I work as much as I can to try and extend out the policy that uh, the principles I use in, in all these other areas. So, again, as I put a Twitter out here, the, the effects caused by marijuana do not justify an absolute prohibition on its consumption. Well, did those effects, so you have to go look at that case. Did they actually argue those things? Are they looking from uh, from what was presented and wasn't shown that the effects that they're deciding on didn't include the good stuff? We don't know. I'm just saying that's what they, they went down the one path to keep control. So this would at least, uh, the statement in the story says that leaving it to lawmakers to regulate consumption of the drug. 
See, they're using it as a synthetic thing in the legal for commerce. That has to be taken out. Then they make a distinction, albeit without allowing them to market it or use other narcotics or psychotropics. There's only a part of that that is identified as a psychotropic. And now we find out even the psychotropics, in at least or uh, the observation of uh, of the one uh, one thing we talked about last week, is that they're re willing to reduce the psych uh, psych uh, psychotropic mushrooms to class class five. That's a use. So, and I make a distinction on marketing it, uh, putting in the commerce stream or marketing it to me. When you have a production right of a plant farm to market, that's a right. That come appurtenant with that land grant to you for the purpose, whether that's a mineral estate uh, that you own the surface to, or the surface estate that you had homestead that you don't earn, the, or even if you don't uh, own the dominant or mineral estate, you still have the right if it's not a reserve a reserve thing on your patent. And I've talked to you years and years now. You can find the statutes that precludes any judicial enforcement against that, and you can preclude any administrative enforcement because their authority doesn't rise that high. Again, the delegation isn't that high. And it couldn't be, which you understand. At that point, government disappears, folks. Poof! Government is irrelevant to all that. I don't know why people don't get this. Government's gone when you understand what your rights are and then enforce them against, well, just present them and then if there's a following, a follow-up criminal, you, uh, you assert the, uh, the remedies to stop that. Isn't that interesting? Everyone's looking to see government gone, and it's right there in the restrict in their restraints. I don't know why that is such a hard thing to understand. You can't do that by being silent. I also know I go back and uh, how we remember I talked about policies and then the shooting of this uh, Matthew Graves over there in Eagle Point, and that the policy now has to be written on everything to protect us. Uh, another story came in behind that again. I like the, the I like the dots uh, to be shown nice and close for people. That uh, follow-up story on that, where I'm asking you to engage the government that's going to come and kill you if you don't do this, uh, to make uh, look at these stories where people are dying for no real good reason and for really just nonsensical reasons, if nothing else. And you're going to have to at least be the one to step up to author a res resolution to that problem in a policy change. That I, that I wanted to look at the problem here as well, uh, returning to that story a bit uh, real quickly. It came up in one report, uh, two, two, two things that were distinct, uh, that, again, the jury cannot, uh, as we identify now, the grand jury, which I think is loaded uh, for the government, and even if it's not, it still didn't see this point. This point here came up a little bit later, uh, a day or two later, about the facts that you would look at in order for it to be decided that would bear upon what you, how you might describe what the officers have to do before they start pulling down on people and shooting them, whether that's with the taser or not. But in a story, uh, it had claimed that the uh, two officers justi were justified because they thought 33-year-old Matthew Graves had a gun. And another statement in that same story said, officers mistook one of their own black stun guns which fell to the floor when they tried to use it on graves for a real gun and killed graves. I ask any any one of you, anyone, explain had and lore. So right here we have facts. The gun, uh, the officer declared, I told you this was, a, this was a false witness at minimum, but I think it was really intentional and a plan. The, uh, the statement by the officer was graves had a gun, but in fact, he also identifies this gun was on the floor. How can Matthew Graves have had a gun when it was on the floor? And how did the jury not see that in order to say, we have, a, we have to fix something here instead of exonerating the condition? And so this is the kind of things I guess I'm just offering. When you go to look and make a policy to save yourself and save those around you from this, these machines, cause we, these uh, soldier machines now, uh, the automatons that we call uh, cops, uh, that they are happen to be programmed now because they're now the new AI, an AI that's not programmed 
uh, will not have to be held accountable, and that's not even looking through the Libra code problem of the soldiers and the occupation. Uh, but if the automatons are not uh, programmed, uh, to, they don't are held uh, accountable. This little had, as in possession by Graves, yet also evidenced later we see the officer actually saw the taser on the floor. And it wasn't actually a gun, was it? It was hit. It was the other officer's taser as well. But let's get this to the point. How can you? How can Matthew Graves have had the gun when it actually was on the floor? It has to be delineated somehow when you go write this policy or come to conclusions about how we start to work to keep these automatons in a program that they're not going to kill you and I. So that's, again, a simple way to start addressing the government. You don't have to vote that way either. See, this is, as I told you before, I'm not into the voting. Those that have the vote, I ask you to do what you can to, to start moving in the right direction. Then I step in. Those that are left in the office, I, those that are in the office, I go in and I attempt to show them the way of the objective basis, not the agenda basis. And we have a lot of resistance to that until we get the right people in. That's how I can tell them as well. And so I come in and uh, we try to uh, show... Uh, what the objective basis is, and we hope we have people that are in, and when we don't, we know who they are, too. And there's a whole other methodology on how you approach that as well, but you have to know that. Again, but this is an objective, we're in a war. That war is worldwide, it reflects on us. What the United States is doing to us, is doing out in the world, it, what's out, what it does out in the world, it does to us. And we have uh, this little story moving on uh, into the international area, showing how fallen the nature is of this, these nations and where they really are when you look at them, and possibly if you look at it in the, in the way I see it, how you can uh, identify how they're not, it can't function properly when it takes on uh, these, these kinds of, uh, the kinds of things that I'm going to talk about here, where we see the rule is before a, a body of uh, so-called nation states, the fallen nature, being reduced down to the the higher the higher uh, ideal of what nations is. If you're a nation state, then you can just be in a fist fight with everybody. But if you're going to be the nobility of a state of a nation, you, you've got to hold that. You no know, diplomacy. We watched diplomacy just go away as they brought this other condition on. But we now are seeing, I think. The turn in the world, and I wanted to point this out, and I guess this is where people finally stop agreeing to the crime. I guess that's why I want to talk about this. Otherwise, in some regard, I have nothing. I could just be like anybody else talking about the woes of the world and how bad it is and all these other things going on and just keep complaining. I want this to reflect about how witnessing a crime and then speaking out and not walking with the enemy of the criminal, with the abuser, is, uh, is required. I think we're looking on the world stage now, and I think this is a signal for us anywhere, not just the United States of America, but anywhere, uh, to step up in the proper way to stop being the witness, uh, the aiding and abating witness without statement. Uh, we see in the world stage only two of the, quote, world lobby voted against the United States and Israel is us relative to the ban of a... Uh, uh, banning Cuba from participating in the world. The only two that allow, wanted to continue the ban was the United States and Israel. The rest of the world said, this ain't happening no more. Now, the laugh, the joke is, that's not going to go far. They've done this 27 times or something. The point is that the world is finally stepping up in a big way to say, we're done with this. What I want to point out as well is Israel and, and the United States here when was Israel a state, a nation, actually? It's been condemned as an occupier. But the United States and Israel are yoked, and we're told don't yoke with an unequal party. You diminish yourself. And I think we're seeing that right here. It's so diminished, the United States just fell off the map of respectability. And so there's principles to observe in the note, in the news about how, how this is all happening. That if you don't start to hold what I'm saying, as I see this applied, as I look at this and apply my thoughts to all this, it's just a reminder how important it is to hold your principles in, up and defend them or make sure they're there to be 
to be at least seen. And that, that takes that, it goes back to the Libra Code as well. You have to be your own occupation, if you will. You have to do your deeds and they have to be principled. And when you don't do them principally, you fall. And this is a evidence of that. Even the world uh, stage is not a place enough that, that the, it's playing out so well for this power. The United States is not going to be stopped by this. It, it's really an awesome power, but it doesn't mean it's right, correct? I mean, it doesn't mean that we should be going down. In fact, it was a, quite a few members of the world body, how Israel is included with that world body, how they allowed that shows you the 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 purpose of the UN actually but uh, the, it was stated by I think it was the Cuban minister and I don't remember his name Perea uh, the United States does not recognize the right to life to peace to development or to security that message was echoed the United States does not recognize the right to life to peace to development and security folks you look at your life in the world right now is that pretty much describe your life. This is coming from a Cuban who is being oppressed, a nation of people that are being oppressed by the same occupier of the world, the United States of America. The right to life, to peace, to development, to security. Your judicial system is an adversarial system, folks. As that didn't tell you. You live under a civil war whether you don't want to recognize it or not. This was a truth spoken by a Cuban. I'm not saying I agree with Cuba or their policies or maybe the harm that their government does to their people. I'm never talking about that. I'm talking about the principles that work out here that people can see. That a government that at some point were promoted, even even wrongly so all these years, and we took on to believe as a white knight, is not a white knight. And then if you turn around and don't can't, don't expect that to harm you the same way, you're living in a, in a fantasy land. And if you think you can then say, oh, that there's nothing I get to, I have to do, I don't, I don't care about that, uh, then you're living as an accessory. You're living as the mentally disabled, uh, what, the Stockholm Syndrome? There's so much that is not good about allowing the criminal to continue. And this comes from our, our, the roots of our nation and the, and the roots of our action. There's many different fronts and facets of how this continues. I try to bring quite a few of those facets to bear and how to address all those all the time. So there's really no excuse in my mind. I, if I can say, I go to, I go to bed at night knowing I've done what I could uh, to expose all this and I'm hoping beyond hope people start taking it uh, taking an interest in it enough to do something, and again, uh, and it's—I uh, can't tell you there's a lot of evidence that they're capable. If people don't even understand what information uh, that I uh, I can provide or friends of mine can provide can actually do. They always seem to answer, respond in a in a way that's not tells us we they don't understand even what they've been handed. It's not a judgment. It means we have a lot of work yet. So me just talking and having a few people. T- to listen or, you know, whatever you do or the 10 minutes you might listen to the broadcast and click away or whatever. I don't know. The numbers don't mean much to me. I don't know what you all have in your head, what you think about, the notes you take. I know there's a few of you that take a lot of notes and I'm just appreciative if you spend the time to do that and I, I just hope you turn it around and start applying it. That's really the big deal for me is you take what I'm saying, don't just listen to it, but turn around and start to work it out. You'll, you'll, you'll come up with your own stuff, but there's not enough of us that are actually doing that. And until there is, it's a bleak. It's going to be bleak. And we see on the world stage, though, the principlelessness is actually, people don't hold to it too well. Even, even, even if they are subject to the, the ban hammer of the President of the United States and the Treasury the, the, underneath this fiat system. Understand how that's working out, too. So, this is a reflection to me. I don't know what to do, but I just know that this is the, men, the, princip- the lack of principle, the lack of moral character that we have in our own country called the United States of America. And I say it's in all other countries as well. Uh, but at this point, it's even gotten so bad that all countries, whether or not I want to have a problem with Israel being a, a nation to be involved with that body to have a say, over Cuba, no less. Any nation, not just it's because it's Cuba. Notwithstanding all that, the, the, it looks like the tide begins to turn. Whether or not anybody can do anything about it, I don't know. But it's a reflection to us, I think, of how t- how depraved what we're up against is. And really, to me, it's saying you really need to look at this because this is what has to be addressed. Otherwise, that depravity is us, folks, is us. 
Another thing that popped up here, I just want to touch base on the political angle, because you talk about what's happening in the world, the United States being this big oppressor, and then the people don't recognize it, at least, and I haven't had anybody argue, again, contrary to what, it, uh, what I've been saying about it, that people believe that there's a second civil war coming, that the United States government somehow ended it. And I've told you, we talked about it, I've read the document. There's no proclamation ending the period of the, of the civil war. It's a continuation. In fact, the statement of proclamation uh, was uh, was pretty clear that it still continues. And, and I haven't gotten anybody commit, uh, commenting to me about that, that I was in error in that interpretation that I told and read to you all and explained it then. Now I'm going to continue to go down to my path and, uh, and support and foundation and principle and research and uh, kind of keep holding that point, that there was no proclamation. In other words, there was no end to the Civil War. Everyone thinks there was, but there wasn't. So this new talk, when I heard the new talk, and it's been pervasive, about the new civil war that's being fomented in the country, United States of America, I realized that's a that's a that's a propaganda. People are so so ignorant; they don't even understand that it hasn't been or it hasn't ended. And what that's doing is that's dividing us even further. Uh, the divided house shall not stand. We're still divided, folks. That's why we're not standing. That's why we're falling at the at the we're falling in, 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 at every point now in the nation. It's coming to. It's coming. The the the, the, root, the pigeons coming to roost, or the, the chicken, whatever. It's foul, folks. But the 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 fomentation of the idea of a civil war has really caught my mind. Not because of the threat of the civil war, although I don't like seeing it. It's because this is to me those that are that actually came up with this are part of the system. And they want to make you believe there's a civil war going on because you won't continue to realize that you're under one and under control. But the idea, nonetheless, is is just as is, is dangerous because they will get us to go at each other's throats. And, uh, again, I don't know how you, how you all perceive how I perceive things and when I look at stuff and what I get out of things, but there was a um, a ruling over a death penalty, it was uh, I think Gary put out as the first person to get the death penalty of the federal hate crime, and uh, I think this is that Dylan Root kid, and this is again not to support any of that. I'm looking at a I'm looking at a condition, I'm looking at a condition that looks like it's creating a thing that that the system wants to keep. Uh, it's a bread and circuses, but it's also worse. It's it's a divide and conquer in place that. I looked at this thing, the death penalty for federal hate crimes, the first person to get the federal, uh, the death penalty. Won't, won't worry about the person, the word, the term. But let's say, what it looked like here, and, and when you look at how law was supposed to do, uh, what what law is to do as far as crime and, and, and judgment and incarceration and all, it's not supposed to be condemnatory, it's supposed to be re rehabilitatory. And you look to see if that's the case, that when the decision to, uh, so-called of, of the jury agreeing, to put someone to death is a declaration that there's no redeeming quality in them whatsoever. That's almost like a double judgment. There. None at all. My problem with all that is I don't know that that inquiry was actually done. And because of what we hear about what the kids said, there may be no redeeming quality. The problem now is a political one of what does that putting him to death do when he's very devout in what he said and did. And at that point, we had a choice. And we had a choice in order to be careful on what path we set the, pop, the populace on. And in my case, in my view in this, we would have actually done a more generous thing to make a different path. What was the other path? They ordered the death of someone. Now it's the first. This is a big deal, right? This can cause a lot of problem. When you look at what the kid was doing, he was uh, devout in his belief about what he'd done. And that creates a serious a dynamic. That when you put someone who's that devout, and I use that word, and it's also it's a religious context, it's cult context and you put them to death you you in, have the high potential of invoking 
a hatred in those other devotees. And you put this one to the first no. It's already advertised. You raise that devotee in death to the martyr status. And that, that to me is a pro really big problem when at the same time the beating of the Civil War drum goes out. It's a lie. We're still under a Civil War that's been quashed, but they want to invoke a Civil War in the people themselves, or the mentality of one. That I made this response to the his, his being provided with a death sentence. Uh, to me, this looks like a plan. It looks like continuation of the plan to foment the division. Because there was another decision that could have been made that took him from society so he couldn't interact with it where there wouldn't be any redeemable quality. It gave him the opportunity maybe to have some redeeming quality. He's a young kid. But that the imposition of death, given his devout nature and those that appear to be as devout in the society that are still running around was a serious miscalculation at, at all where the judge is supposed to be looking over the society and really looking for what's good as society within the context of the of the of the criminal uh, code and that I uh, made this observation given his apparent stated devoutness instead of life in prison doesn't this at least where death means nothing redeemable in him offer the perception of a martyr and the protest rights for the faithful is this government promotion of civil war over revolutionary war. Because what we're talking about in uh, trying to throw off the occupier is more of the revolutionary war. And if they get us infighting, that's more of a civil war. And the government's already proven it can be, win that one. And I'm real concerned about this decision. Why Why couldn't they just put it life imprisonment without possibility of parole? Given he's so devout, he wants to come out and kill lots of other people. That's what that whole purpose is. Accountability, social accountability, that's what that's supposed to be. I suppose we could have a philosophical discussion on where else to put the kid, but I'm not into that, talking about that. I'm looking at very real uh, possibilities that were being played, and uh, this was one of them. Where they had a choice, they chose death. When they had a choice of life imprisonment, which wouldn't make him a martyr, they chose to make him a martyr. And I didn't realize that until I read the comments that he said, uh, the kid himself. The devout is, may not even be strong enough. And there's a whole bunch of people that believe like him or want to believe like him. And wouldn't that make a great tool by the government who wants to keep uh, the populace uh, going at each other's throats. And so, whether I'm right or wrong, it's kind of neither here nor there, except to the point of doing the analysis. Did anybody do, do that analysis at all? Did it come to anything? Will it go there? I certainly can't know. It's all conjecture. I'm saying that the potential is there. And the government uh, gets a lot of mileage on the potentials. Look at what's going on already, and they haven't even started to do it. The people haven't even... The government hasn't even ceded much of anything. Again, the, 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 the evidence of that is the memification of, of the social networks. You can watch how fast off ideas get traction. Totally devoid of, of any historical actual contemplation or cause and effect or interaction or potentials. And completely devoid. And that kind of bothers me in, in a way I could say scares me, in quote, scares me a bit uh, for us. I don't, I don't see us coming out of that. Uh, the revolutionary war is what we're looking into because we have this occupier that's uh, now not even respected in any regard in the world. And it happens to be the government that has its jack boot on everybody's neck and we still haven't done anything. That I think would be, if I was going to look at the, the choice between a civil war and a revolutionary war, I think I'd be looking to, to avoid another civil war. We know that outcome. What I'm asking you as a revolution is evolutionary engagement. It's what I'm asking you from behind the woodshed. We don't have to go to the revolution. The revolutionary war may not have been, it got us here as well. So it may not have been such a success. And there's a different dynamic in the world 
that we may may be able to focus on that'll give us a lot a lot better option, a lot more options than what we've seen in the past, and actually bring us to a point where we can get along, actually. And again, that's why I kind of like the I kind of like the law of the land, the land law. It, it does that for us. And I've just explained a couple of ways on how you make government inert, so I don't know what the point is. I don't know why everyone's such against the government when the government's inert to you when you're situated correctly. And when it's not inert to you when it ought to be, it's a criminal, and that should have accountability. And that would be just the amount of the mass of, of, of knowledgeable masses of coming together to not, not allow the criminal to continue under the color of a government official. And not allow those agents that they have in the Bar Association to, make, to get, convince people of that. And I'm back to the point about the miners. They get involved and they, they get the bad advice from a bar attorney and they get to, they start filing pieces of paper that they ought not to hear. There's no support for it. They don't argue that point. They don't challenge that authority. They don't challenge the extent, the limitation on the delegation. All of a sudden the government becomes relevant in their life. And it destroys them through their court system. And what was the counter story? I had a bunch of a couple friends go up in the forest. They say, hey, your delegation authority doesn't extend to close me out of the forest. I get to use the highway like it was granted to me. Wow, poof, no government. Now, I don't know what, why we don't engage, and we're not trained to engage. I don't know why we don't want to get uh, kind of geared up to start to engage that. I'm trying to offer different pathways to, to, to do that so that we can start to not have this incidental stuff keep getting in our face and having it used against us. If you had a system that was looking up for the security and safety of a bunch of people that want to do harm, why would you give them, hand them, a ticket to ride by martyrizing somebody? Like I said, look over in the Middle East what happens. Look what I'll give them all to coming home. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that right there. So. Uh, be cautious on what you think you're seeing in all this. I, I think these are, if nothing else, uh, to me, it's a, certainly a subliminal signal. And the problem with those is that they foment like a like a wound, and they fester, and they and they puss up with underneath the surface. You don't see them until until they explode. And I'd rather live in a more peaceful, uh, predictable place, in a way. Otherwise, you you have that just abject chaos that everyone denies is 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 is, uh, is going on, and they just tolerate it. It's not tolerable, but they tolerate it. So, uh, so another thing coming down, we talk about a bit here, and I I bring this up only because we the con the condition of the system is to continue the question, and there's a little mechanism in the, and we tend to take uh, assumptions on lots of this stuff, even though it's a question. And we allow the system of legal to tie us up in these conundrums. And there's a mechanism in the in the uh, remedy in the code to get things de declared called declaratory judgment. Uh, and you can do it for yourself. I don't talk too much about them, and I I haven't uh, chosen to go down that path, uh, and I haven't needed to at this point. And I, I found my way over to the equity side better, at least for the subject matters that I deal with. And I told you you don't deal in question, so. There would be no need in my mind to do a declaratory judgment where the laws, rights, or interests are declared in law. I've been astonished that more people don't, don't do this. And uh, this little story brings up my mind here about that. Uh, Arkansas, Arkansas, well, if there are, if there, if Arkansas, then what about Kansas? Which one's Kansas if there are Kansas? is now confirmed a permitless carry state. Was a title here. Carrying a firearm without an Arkansas concealed handgun carry license has been a somewhat gray area. So there you go, the gray area created by legal. No black and white. We get to mess with it, right? And yet there's this mechanism in the in the law that they have to recognize. It's one of the older, older uh, remedies that you can end this gray area that I think more people need to start ending the gray area. But here they admit this is a gray area. Since the General Assembly enacted Act 746 in 2013, which amended the statute 573120 to state, a person commits the offense of carrying a weapon if he or she possesses a handgun, knife, or club on or about his or her person 
in a vehicle occupied by him or her or otherwise readily available for use with a purpose to employ a handgun, knife, or gun as a weapon against a person. The important part of this is the last part, quote, with a purpose to attempt to unlawfully employ the handgun, knife, and club as a weapon against a person, close quote. Since then, many people have argued that Arkansas has a permitless carry state, was a permitless carry state. But the Attorney General, an attorney, a general, Leslie, a general, Leslie Rutledge, uh, disagreed, stating open carry has legal, was legal, but an Arkansas concealed handgun license is still required to carry, uh, to conceal carry in Arkansas. Now, I don't know where the right to keep and bear and the lack of uh, and a permit didn't uh, didn't infringe on that because it's a permit. The regulation is a permit, and, and in the context of what you need, the right to conceal a weapon is nobody's business that you're carrying, even against the government. But notwithstanding all that, this report is. Then on October 17, 2018, October 17, 2018, the Arkansas Court of Appeals made a, a ruling that pretty much cemented the fact that Arkansas is a permitless carry state. Yesterday, the Arkansas Court of Appeals issued Taft versus State, Taft versus State, which was a, a which is an appeal from a conditional guilty plea. The trial court had denied Mr. Taft's motion to suppress, but the Court of Appeals reversed. Mr. Taft had been go seen going in and out of a store several times, possibly with a gun. The store owner called it in, and the police went to check it. The officer activated his blue lights when he saw Mr. Taft walking down the highway, turned around, and made contact with Taft. That's T-A-F-F. In the end, the court ruled that it was the illegal seizure and suppressed the evidence. The quote that was important here, the state argued that the officer uh, Davis seized Taft because he, quote, had to determine the lawfulness of Taft's conduct going in and out uh, of the store and carrying that weapon and acting suspiciously, quote, quote. Merely possessing a weapon is not a crime in the state of Arkansas. They give a quote of a name, provide a quote, the, the, the statement of the, uh, the statute states, provided that, providing that, A, a person commits the offense of carrying a weapon if he or she possesses a handgun on or about his person with the purpose to attempt and unlawfully employ the gun as a weapon against a person. The pause I just made are the elements that they're reading out. I told you, go look at the elements. This is in almost all states, folks, where I don't understand what the question is here. Why, if you just go look at that, you can develop this for yourself, local to you, and go to a declaratory judgment and get rid of this gray matter area. Under the clear language of Section 573-120A, the possessor of a handgun must have an unlawful intent to employ it as a weapon against the person in order to make the possession a criminal act. Under the rule of leniency, not law, under the rule. You see how they do this. Under the rule of lenity, lenity, any doubts as to the interpretation of a criminal statute are resolved in favor of the defendant. Any doubts, folks? There is another, and that's a, just attach that to your uh, civil declaration and say that, that's the standard if it goes criminal and there's a threat against the criminal imposition. I want to I eliminate the gray area. Law is supposed to be objective. There ought not be any gray areas. Any ones that you find said that they didn't make the law right or they're not deciding it right. That's another point, you say. And you want to clear this up. There is nothing in the record before us to indicate that Taft demonstrated any sort of in unlawful intent with a weapon prior to the engagement of blue lights, such as threatening someone in the store or brandishing the weapon. That would have been given the officer reasonable suspicion of a crime sufficient to effectuate the stop with the blue lights. Boy, these blue lights, this is the blue light special, folks. To the contrary, Officer Davis's testimony was clear that there was no indications of unlawful activity and intent, and that he had no information that would have indicated Taft's possession of the gun was unlawful. Now, this author goes on to say, that Arkansas is really a constitutional carry now, and you don't need the permit. My problem with that is that's an opinion that appears to be true, 
but because the, he admits that it's a gray area and continues to be based on his interpretation, I, with this new case, would not let that question be not decided by a declaration in law. And you take these, you should take these facts, especially now in Arkansas, and you go and you find out by a declaration that this, in fact, is the case. That without an intention to harm someone and do the five elements there and that, I think it was five elements, that you have a right to carry notwithstanding the law that requires the uh, permit. In other words, registration. And you argue against that as an unreasonable infringement where there would be no intention anyway. In other words, you also argue the fact that it, the permit, uh, getting a permit, the application of it presumes you guilty in violation of that law as well, where it simply says you can carry as long as you don't have the intent uh, to harm and don't attempt to harm. I mean, in some illegal act, other act. So, uh, this is interesting to me. Uh, you can, uh, without jeopardy, you don't wait till you don't walk into the gray area. You can have that gray area declared, and it may go you're against you, but then you get it standing to go argue about that part as well. But as I showed you, if you argue that there's a, a right and the grant was a prohibition against the government, they don't even have a jurisdiction to find against you. And if you know that part of it, now the, 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 tide, the government starts to become irrelevant at that point. And so my observation is, Arkansas, great. Okay, you have some things there you can kind of work on. See, I've never understood this concealed carry nonsense anyway. Haven't had a chance or need to go after that part of it. And so it hasn't been something that I've been uh, been focused on. But when I see this kind of stuff and I see that there's a lot of people that do have the problem, and I see the article that says this is a gray matter area, and then the opinion is it's solved in this case, I'm saying, no, this is too serious a condition to actually walk yourself into. But it's more serious that you don't get the black and white answer, or at least how the system is 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 talking. And then, without I don't know how I would approach this problem, but it would be a part of my thoughts. Understand that the one you're going to is the one that's signed on through the Bar Association that agrees as an NGO with the UN to put a knot in that gun. That might need to be a statement of bias uh, claim and a conflict of interest put into your complaint in the declaration to highlight the, again, the fact of the right to do so. The lack of intent, prerequisite intent in your mere carrying and therefore the fact of your right to carry absent a permit as any way you have a right to keep and bear, any way you choose. Anyway, you lay this out. I think leaving this as a gray area is dangerous. Uh, I think this is evidence, though, to lay out the elements of the points that will allow someone there to make get that case, at least in Arkansas. And I think if you look closely, you'll see this is applicable in probably all states. It just hasn't been presented. It's been allowed to be uh, uh, covered over. Uh, and this is not any much different than what I keep talking about. It assert the, Don't assert the question. Assert the right. Assert that you want the declaration to say this because of these elements. And because there's a, a gray area, a par apparent gray area that's now been created. Use this stuff to get in to shut down and make the government irrelevant. The government's gone here, folks. It really is. Once you start to see it, the only reason why it's not gone isn't government. It's because those in government want to do you harm under the color of government. That's a felony. As we move in on these uh, these issues and have to listen to the information, the watch. I don't like watching when I hear gray gray uh, matter, uh, gray gray matter gray areas. I don't like uh, these. Uh, we're supposed to be black and white. It's supposed to be written black and white. Yes, there's some interpretational stuff, but you know when a, when it says uh, like a grant on the patent says it's conveyed to you forever, or to your heirs and assigns forever. I think that's pretty well black and white. When a corollary statute says that there's no judicial authority to interfere, that's pretty black and white. When a delegation of authority doesn't write us up to to uh, interfere, that's pretty black and white. That's the uh, territory, if you will, that I want you all to start thinking in. And then you find all the ways that there's an encroachment by the confusion of that. As we heard our author last year, I'm confused. Here's why. We give the reason. But things alien to the black and white become a problem. The promotion of things alien to the black and white 
become a problem. Uh, and we are fed this nonsense stuff, and we get our mind all into it. And again, there is a lot of talk about a civil war, and there's lots of areas of discussion that kind of foment that, that I'm a little concerned, or not for the fact of the civil war, because if we're in one, it'll just be our fighting ourselves. But the how we get led into, the, led by the nose in all this stuff is a, is a, when I watch what's going on, it terrifies me a bit. How, how gullible are people that they allow this to happen to themselves? How, how lack of actual critical thought do they have when they profess to have a critical thought? And that's the other thing I'm noticing in some of the feeds. I notice other people that pl claim to have a, a critical thought do not respond to anything where I point out a problem with that critical thought. The basis of the thought, it starts wrong. I don't see how you can get to a point where you can make an assertion. And I point out the error, I would appreciate a response. You know, you got a point there. Maybe we'll have to re-look. No, nobody says that. They, they, they just don't respond. So call so much for the social network. This happened again to get uh, to us. Uh, this, uh, a, a, this civil war-ish type idea, uh, fomenting ideas that are really not there, uh, making issues that don't. And again, I look at this kind of a lot of neutrality. I'm not even in, into analyzing these people for who they are. We're going to be moving now to Portland, uh, Multnomah County in Portland, Oregon, uh, and they're known for allowing like Antifa to beat up, you know, beat up people and do to cause property damage. And they said that when Trump, the night Trump got elected, they were going to allow it, and that's what we've seen. And they're like the hub of what all this nonsense, fascism-looking stuff is. But in this case, uh, this was a conservative view attacking somebody in uh, Portland about a decision over an illegal alien that got released from prison, uh, excuse me, jail, uh, the county jail, and, and went and killed his wife. And the, the uh, politics here, seemingly to fuel this uh, this political view instead of the law, the view in the law, was a misinterpretation of what was being said, all to be able to try and blame uh, an official, which, when you go and read through it, isn't necessarily the case. Illegal alien murders wife after Portland sheriff sets him free without notifying ICE. Let me read that again, because it's pretty... I didn't want to read most of the story, but here, but what tale is, because you have to read through it to, to pick it through, but illegal alien murders wife after Portland sheriff sets him free without notifying ICE. ICE is the immigration uh, group that's supposed to pick this guy up who's supposed to be wanted or whatever, but you find out when you go read, instead of the sanctuary policy the author was trying to show, this is a guy that's got 300,000 followers, uh, the, he was trying to point out that the sanctuary policies are illegal and deadly relative to an illegal alien killing his wife in Multnomah County. He forgot to go read about what the case was actually about and go read what the provision of the code, the rule now is relative to ICE and this configuration between this uh, res supposed responsibility between the county government and the federal government. And when you go read what is clearly linked in the report from the news article relative to this promotion that sanctuary policies are illegal and deadly, there's another, another tale that starts to develop. This ultimately, there's a case that's referred to called Miranda Oliveras versus Clackamas County in Oregon that has been decided on this. And when you look at what the decision says, when you look at what the basis for what's going on is, there's a rule provision that is not mandatory on local government. And the problem additionally is the Oregon courts have said if there's nothing else to hold them on, the people on, you can't keep them for an immigration hold because there's no crime. There's no probable cause. And that's likely why the rule is not obligatory. That is completely missed in this story about someone sending, uh, wants to, do, to uh, vilify sanctuary city policies, sanctuary policies as illegal and, and, and deadly. And in fact, that's irrelevant to the rule that the court cases and the, and the president actually speaks to. 
What we're actually speaking to is due process. We're actually speaking to there has to be probable cause to keep you in jail. And these things are to be held absolutely. That the author of this policy is attacking sanctuary policy. And I'm not saying that sanctuary policy, I'm, uh, I'm not promoting sanctuary cities. There's a whole other problem. I'm looking at how someone is promoting a sanctuary policy because they're against them, wrongly promotes it, and we get into this thing, the idea that sanctuary cities are no good because of this, and it's not at all the case. The law was actually correct. It was the federal agency expecting too much, and the county agencies can't act that far because there's a constitutional rights that are being violated in the gray area that the court has now made not gray, that it appears the county sheriff was actually right. Because you can't hold people that don't have a chargeable offense against them in, in jail, and you can't hold them without bail. So in other words, if you do have a chargeable offense, you still have to let them go if there's bail. And there's a whole lot more to look at this story. It's actually pretty instructive. And it kind of irked me a little, a lot actually. These are promoted through the social media as the thing to say and the accurate point and the on-point logic and the politically right view. And it's ab and these are by critical thinkers, so-called, and it's absolutely incorrect and wrong. And in fact, this is one of the things that that county, where I may not like that county or what it does or its officials or its politics, uh, they had to do this thing right, and they in fact did this thing right, apparently, from what I've read as I've restudied this case, as I study it, it's applied to what goes on in the facts against the man who goes back in and kills his own wife. Am I supporting him in doing that? Absolutely not. But there's other mechanisms that go on. You're seeing the failure of the system, even though it tries to keep track of the constitutional rights. People are going to be people. They're going to do what they're going to do. What this ends up doing, in my view, is it trivializes the wife and makes her really a public nuisance. Why? Because there's no mechanism to go uh, after uh, after the problem that they couldn't find in the guy. They tried to get him with a jury, where the jury tr where a jury wouldn't uh, go after a cop. It wouldn't go after this guy either. There was nothing to hold him on. He had it in for his wife. She apparently didn't know of any other mechanisms, and I don't know how the, the, promo the system promotes a piece of paper can shield you from death. I don't get that. But where she starts, the, the, the system fails her, she becomes like a public nuisance because, in my mind, it says that they, they didn't have a public, uh, a public safety issue to concern. Con uh, they didn't have a vi the state wasn't a victim in order to create the the state uh, the, the victimization to go after him. And I looked at that and I said, well, that's a lie because they do that on every traffic ticket. The state becomes the victim of the violation in order to go after you because it's a public safety concern. Now I'm treading down some very dangerous road here, but you see how nonsensical it becomes really quickly. First of all, you don't look at the, you you put the uh, you, you discuss the sanctuary policy as being illegal and deadly, and in fact it's irrelevant. And that gets us off the point of what's going on, and then we never get to the point in the future. How do we save this woman? No, we can't save her. Excuse me. These women like this. How do we save that? It's a totally different r r view. But if you go down that where all of a sudden now the public government, the government has a public safety concern, we're back to community care. What happened to that, folks? See, they only do it where what? You can take all this thing that I talk about, public safety, prosecuting traffic violations, and take all your S's and you go ahead and make them dollar signs. And I think we'll see why. The wife became, a, by this process, became a public nuisance because she's not protectable and traffic tickets are not. Did I just jump too far for people here, folks? See, they're not a, there's not principles that apply across the board. And I'm not saying that that's going to be an easy answer. I'm saying we allow in our minds, oh, sanctuary cities are no good for this reason. And we go, ah, we, the pitchforks and torches come out. It's nonsense. You're further divorced from the condition. You're further divorced from what actually could have worked. You're further divorced from actually solving a problem, a real problem. This is my, my problem with the, what climate change. 
There may be a real problem, but it's not going to be get, gotten to through a hypothetical relationship to a statistical model. It's not going to happen. And so we have uh, critical thinkers on the Internet wanting to talk about how philosophical they are. Uh, who want to also make a political point, and they they miss they miss completely, and they and they and they don't even give credit to the people who are actually starting to do it right, or at least within the constraints of the way it exists at this point. Is I guess another problem. No one seems to be rooted in any reality at all, and yet I can pull and extract the reality that makes better sense than the critical thinker might. Doesn't mean that I agree with sanctuary cities the way they're working. But that's a whole, we got a whole other thing to start looking at there. Uh, the, the, they may be dead. Me, this covers up that point. They may be illegal and they may be deadly, but you're not going to get through them through the ICE violating a ru its own rule that the, the county, by its, its rules, by its judicial determinations in that state, you want to talk about states' rights, is required to honor due process for people that are not charged with crime. Do you want to break that, folks? Does that have anything to do with sanctuary, sanctuary cities, or sanctuary policy, excuse me? Again, mark on the beach, uh, protonmail.com. Let me know how, because I'm, I'm, I'm working hard to try and see it, and I'm just not seeing it, folks. And it covers all this stuff, all this nonsense we come up with, covers up the real story that we're supposed to be really paying attention to. Are, are you... Folks, are you getting that? Are you getting that we do the wrong things? We're covering up the things we need to do. We're taking our time and mis, uh, misappropriating our own time against what should happen. And, uh, uh, misappropriating our time and our thoughts, which create more misappropriation of time and thoughts. Passing the stuff around, even. I'm not saying I like what I'm reading on all this case and how this came down, but at the point of due process... But I've been at this point where you have people in jail, and you I used to write the habeas corpus, and uh, then uh, they throw your friend out in the street at 2 in the morning, hardest time to get a ride or anything. Uh, they'll throw you out because uh, they weren't supposed to hold you. Why? Because there was no, no reason, no probable cause. They just made it up. And at that point, I want that rule to be recognized in the first instance. If there was trouble in these people in their relationship, that's a whole different issue. But let's not throw now on top of this the uh, uh, what appears to be a bad bad move for the states, cities of the states going to sanctuary cities, so called. I haven't really made that analysis. Just there's a couple things that I know that it shouldn't be doing. They're attempting to do it. It's all agenda based. It's all really method, uh, uh, consensus based in a way uh, more than uh, law based. And the people that are inside your governments are all consensus based. So the the outcomes not the outcome is going to work out what they have and they plan and it causes trouble. It causes division. And here's the problem: that false division keeps us from what, focusing on what we need to keep. In other words, that the due process means the process means something. You have to have a probable cause to keep anybody. And even in this country, when you have probable cause to keep someone, they can bail out, whether that's OR, your own recognizance on your word, or by money. But anyway, the, these uh, these high thinkers, these critical thinkers, these uh, trivium thinkers, uh, really kind of starting to irritate me a lot. Uh, that uh, we make political statements that we think we're such high-minded thinkers, and we're not. We're missing major, major points. And to me, that's not only dangerous, it becomes a serious defect that we can't fix because now we start going through the world with a missing a political view on the politics that we have no control over at some level at all because we're not engaged the right way if we go there. We're always looking from the outside, but we're talking about political things like we know what we're talking about. And so this rule that was violated by ICE, the federal agency, because there's no mandatory imposition, uh, was not does not impose any obligation on the on the county, the sheriff of which is obligated to look at due process regarding criminal hold, criminal jail. That he's dealing with a nutcase 
really isn't his problem either, although there may have been a mechanism to check another thing, but there was no evidence of that either. And so we see the limit of the law, too, here. We see where the government can only do so much anyway. And if it has a limit, then why aren't we using those limits to defend ourselves against what we need to do? Why aren't we asserting that we have rights to protect ourselves in that defense instead of getting in an argument that where a judge can tie a knot in a barrel of your gun and now this woman is put into some kind of hardship that she can't actually have been explained to her? Here, you're going to need this. The government can only go so far. If the government can only go so far, why does it go everywhere else that you, that you allow it? What is it about this illegal alien anyway? And this became a part of the news as well, which I found fascinating because what it starts to dig up is we're getting back into our Civil War problem. I find this fascinating. When people just miss the wrong thing. They look at the wrong thing. They'd rather focus in on certain things. To, and I think this is a plan. This is a government propaganda plan. There's people in the system that know to get you fired up on something you'd have no clue about, can't work through, but you feel about it. Shut your brain off. You, you, you think you turned your brain on. That's the worst one that I'm noticing. You think you got your brain running, and it's running actually to, off a cliff, and you, you're in free fall, and you think that's cool. Look how easy thinking is. And you ain't doing any of it. You're, agreeing, you're just agreeing to the noise of the wind in your ear, not, reali in your ears, not realizing, uh, well, asking, like, why am I accelerating down this cliff that don't go nowhere? What's that thing approaching me? But I'm a thinker thinking about all the wrong things, but that's, I'm a thinker. It's not going to get us anywhere. But this illegal alien issue is now coming up. We know then build the wall. This not, I just wonder how much of this has been planned. Got the caravan coming up. I, got, I haven't really looked at all that. I just noticed this is nonsense. It brings up these, it brings up these divisions. It brings up the ability for people to, to overcome your thoughts, overcome what the issue is. No one is, uh, whether by laziness or just completely Un, unaware of how to go to the points inside the discussion and say, wait a minute, now we've got a foundation to keep here. If we let our foundation turn to sand, we have nothing to stand on. See, did you, did you catch the the sanctuary policy was not law, so, so saying the policy is illegal and, and deadly, it's off point anyway? It would be just a policy, wouldn't it? And so well, instead of complaining about it, you got to go roll up both sleeves and you got to go take ha and handle that policy. Don't just stand there and complain about it. Some other woman's going to die. But see, it wasn't the point. And this is not an easily solved problem as well. That's the whole point. I'm all other point. You start looking at the reality of this. This is a sad condition. And I don't know what the answer would be, but it's certainly not going to be to take away all of our rights uh, and remove the presumption of innocence and remove the checks and balances that give us a measure a measure of distance against a, a system that just feeds off of everybody when they incarcerate, puts you all in a jail. That uh, people are having their, they're, they're in jail wherever they live, it seems, and then, then they can be used as pawns. And when I said Agenda 2030, although I hadn't thought of it before, it just came to mind, is about migration. And so to me, all this is just playing out this big uh, script that we've been running because none of us has stepped up in, in the right places in the right way. And like I've been suggesting better, I think, uh, than m most everything else I've seen around to interfere with this stuff. But uh, what pops up interesting about this, uh, also in the story about Multnomah and sanctuary cities and the big, bi big battle going on between illegal aliens and not in the invasion and all this other stuff. Trump and birthright citizenship pops up about on the on the on the on the world stage about discussing it. Sadly, some persist in their unbelief that most notably the never Trumps over over at the increasingly irrelevant National Review, who have published a piece taking the absurd position that concept of birthright citizenship is not only constitutional but an integral part of the originalists' interpretation of the U.S. Constitution. The conservative Beltway publication, National Review, published a piece in which their legal columnists, columnist argues that the, quote, constitutional originalism requires, close quote, that United States citizenship be given to the children of illegal aliens. Yeah, I won't keep, I can read, 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 read. Let me go back to the bold and then I'm going to move back up because we've already seen enough here. 
actually of what I just read. For a policy for a policy perspective, uh, there is a fair grounds, fair grounds, fair grounds. That's what happens in the summertime in the animals in the carnival. Yeah, for debate, there are reasonable objections to the abuse of birthright citizenship, but also serious problems of principle practice with changing it. But from a legal perspective, the answer should be clear. A proper originalist interpretation of the United States Constitution, as presently written, guarantees American citizenship to those born within our borders. The Supreme Court, however, has never explicitly ruled that the children of illegal aliens must be granted automatic citizenship, and many legal scholars dispute the idea. The Supreme Court has indeed not said birthright citizenship is constitutional, and legal scholars have noted that supporters of birthright citizenship, a gross misinterpretation of the 14th Amendment, ignore the intentions of those who wrote the amendment. I'll end there, because it brings up, like I said, it brings up everything you need to know. Uh, birthright citizenship, when you look at the Constitution being an origination of a government, uh, cannot exist. And I think you need to look very carefully what the 14th Amendment did. We're back into your equal rights, folks. We're back into that law after, this, after the Civil War was not ended but continued over the whole of the country. At uh, Title 42 in uh, Section 1981, that you're going to be subject to exactions of every kind and no other. Equally. Go look at it. 42 U.S.C. 1981. That the citizenship, they said United States citizen. I don't know if you've only looked at these statutes. There's citizen of the United States. There's two types of citizens of the United States, at least. Uh, the, by the name, you can't tell that. Uh, there's a U.S. persons, U.S. citizens, the United States citizens. All of these have different statuses. I want to remind you that if you look in your statutes, and you may find this in the, in the commercial code, actually, that your definition for the United States is located in Washington, D.C. When you start to put all these factors and elements together, you start finding out that you, there's no such thing as a citizenship the way we have believed that it is. There's no birthright that way. And well, my, my view on this and what it fascinates me is when you look through this matter, you're going to come on to uh, a couple court cases that are like the Dred Scott case. It's probably one of the hardest cases I've read to understand, but when you walk into it thinking what we were told about citizenship and people and freed people and uh, blacks in a, by a color, the type of people that were brought in and put into a certain status, you can't understand that case. When you start listening more of what, having some familiarity with what I've been straight, how I've been discussing these things, then you start to understand what was going on. It's how I could point out to you that how 42 U.S.C. 1981 exists there as a, an imposition to those within the jurisdiction. The status of citizenship of which is not determined like we are understanding, and it can't be. Neither did the government of the United States over there in Washington, D.C. have jurisdiction over the entire nation of Union countries. And this is a fascinating study. It boggles the mind to go through it. You can't walk into this one. You're going to walk into it with your own thoughts about it, but those are, though your thoughts about this are likely wrong. And as, lo as long as you hold those thoughts, it's going to be very hard to understand this. But this question of birthright citizenship is very interesting, and I think it's one attached to the people coming in from the caravan and the wall and all that that are obscuring your study, your better study, to find out what that really is. Forget the birthright. What about the citizenship thing? And we can go through all the discussion I've heard people talk about. A lot of you probably already know citizens just subject in a different way. Who, you know, that's the, what the word begins and ends. You're subject. You're not free. You're subject to exactions of very kind equally in that, in that status if you're subject to that jurisdiction. How can you be a sovereign? How can you be free? How can you be anything other than subject? There's a whole study behind this I can't even get into, and I won't get into it here. I don't have the time. It's fascinating, though, to watch how we've been duped and how we've been able to look past things like 42 U.S.C. 1981. What is that citizenship, and what does it mean? We've gone weeks and months and years in discussion, I guess, and you need to, to understand it. But I find it very fascinating. This is being brought up right now as there a va invasion of people coming across the border, and it has nothing to do with any of that. 
No different than that rule has nothing applicable from ICE to the county relative to a constitutional provision, the due process. You don't put people in jail without probable cause, and, uh, and if they're in, they don't they have a chance to escape that even pending trial. Why? Because there is a principle of innocence until proven guilty. A bit, isn't there? Maybe not to your pocketbook. Maybe not to having to give your word up in consideration to leave as own recognizance. But you do get to have a bit of a presumption of innocence. So do we want to focus on the political nonsense or do we, uh, or, and lose that, or do we want to start looking at the foundation of what goes on? Getting back to the United States citizenship, it's a very confusing kind of a condition. It's a, it, 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 but if, once you start to get a handle on it, you start to come, and I don't know how you'd come to a conversation different than what I've been giving you all these years, on how you challenge certain things. It, there's a status incorporated in that that cannot, it's not birth generated unless you go to the fact that being born in that state by a corporate status, that can happen, but it's a legalism born. It's the fictional mirror, the, the, uh, this mirror of birth, if you will. Corporations and legal entities and those statuses are born in the state of their origination. They don't issue quick that's the term for you. But they're born in the state. They're not natural, although they're de described as natural to the state. Why well, you get natural citizenship. But uh, this is a very fascinating study. It's a very uh, convoluted study. But once you get the handle on it, uh, it's, it starts to get, cl you start to get clarity on the, this is a tool of deception. And that it's coming together now with us focusing on people invading uh, the United States. And I do believe there needs to be some buffer. I remember I told you we're like a cell. We have a different type of a, of a, we have a different type of an existence in the United States of America. We have a different set of laws. Uh, no, we're notwithstanding any of the violations to them. We have a different style of land laws that to me is just the critical part. And we can't have people just invading without some assimilation and understanding about that. No different than a cell in a, in a body. And so I believe in, in, like, there has to be some kind of a, a transition period. You just don't invade a space. I mean, it's trans, it's, where do they go anyway? There's no way to handle it. And I don't think anybody's been talking about prohibition. Remember, the regulated, the, it's the regulated entry. You might want to talk about uh, uh, arbitrary borders. Well, yeah, those are there, but there's a jurisdictional powers and authorities for what? for enforcing or for acknowledging or for enjoying certain objective basis we call law. Otherwise, what we have is stakeholders, Genghis Khan and the Horde, knocking at your door, wanting in. There's no order at that point. No expectation of accountability. No expectation that uh, your life is going to be anything but what others decide for it. Then people won't put up with it. It just that's the way it's going to devolve right now. I don't know about anybody's utopian idea, but uh, getting onto this birthright citizenship, it really is a problem because you're dealing in this. Everyone wants to say it's a corporation. Yeah, you're, it's a legal entity. It's been created. It's a it's a tool. It's, it has no citizenship unless you're in it, and there's a certain processes for getting into it. What they do is they attach you in a fraudulent imposition of that style of entity. It does control or through things you've used so your voluntariness comes into play and your ignorance and then you don't know how to say but 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 wait so when does the citizenship start is a very interesting question where how is very interesting over what how all that is very interesting and we see the translation from legal fiction over to life, and we get the people that are con uh, convoluting that. So we miss the point about this legal legalness of it, or the, over the life of it. And that causes questions internally. Pretty great questions, societal questions. In the same context, they're talking about birthright citizenship. We get this story. Woman who killed her baby has conviction overturned. Court says six-day-old baby isn't a person. Now, I don't think they actually said that. What they said was the damage that happened to a baby that hadn't been born yet, born issue quick, was not cognizable as a person 
that status of subjection, the citizen of some sort, until it issued quick and then was handed over by some mechanism they could anticipate. In legal. It's a very interesting story. You want to go read the birthright citizenship, read this one. And then you start to understand the problem of what happened when they tried to commingle legalism with people. And they tried to say that they could protect you. Maybe why the woman's dead over there in Oregon. Why she became a nuisance with respect to the remedies that was available through the government. Because remember, all the nuisances they get to go, that's you traffic citation people, you violators. They go after those as a victimhood. But not that woman. Do you, do you, do you understand what I'm saying here, folks? There's a limit. And it, when you see the limit, it's strict liability to you. And always on the take is the system on the other side. They can make any excuse that they need in order to do what? It sounds like cha-ching to me. They control what they want to control, when they want to control. And you have to know that you, there's some things they don't. And at that point, you're strictly liable. It could mean your life. In this case, your death. In this case, the woman who hasn't had the baby yet, who was in, a, who was in an accident, and maybe drinking, I think the story is, did damage to the baby, which subsequently against caused the death of the baby after the baby was born. But because it happened before, it was cognizable as a person. It wasn't culpable upon the mother for the harm. Where was this birthright citizenship? You just when you agree, and that's the other thing. You get, you agree to birthright citizenship. You just agreed to people before birth issuing quick even. Didn't have rights. You've agreed to that. But this is another trap because they're saying that they have the right to regulate any of it. But you don't have a say. No, I'm not advocating for abortion. I'm saying this is the reality of things that, ha that we find in life that go on. The Times Union reports Jennifer Jorgensen previously was found guilty of second-degree manslaughter for causing the death of her baby daughter in a crash, in a car crash. She also was indicted for driving under the influence of drugs and alcohol, endangering the welfare of a child. Remember, rights of child is also legalisms. Am I agreeing with what she should do? Absolutely not. I'm just saying, this is how they encroach with an issue. They create this issue for themselves, and then they start messing around with people's lives. And the people, I mean, I don't even know what the cause for this woman to be so uh, in, in, engaged in drugs and alcohol while she was a baby. There's a big disconnect in that woman to start with. Where was that cause? Maybe the same system? Who knows? In October, the New York uh, Court of Appeals reversed Jorgensen's conviction, ruling that she was not guilty because she fatally injured her daughter before she was born. The court ruling compared Jorgensen's actions to self-induced abortion and called it an offense that was no greater than a misdemeanor. I'm saying, why do they even have that right then, folks? You see how they gave themselves a gray area. At any rate, uh, this is an important case to understand relative to birthright citizenship, uh, the legalism of birthright citizenship, and then this uh, attachment of legalism to and uh, accountability or liability or culpability to the legal system before birth. These are critical things you need to understand and study for. And they're fascinating at one level, but they're exposing a big chasm, which I would hope people would truly start to understand. The other thing is apparently they're going to help hold her culpable if after the birth. But then you see what the government does over here in New Jersey. Nine children dead as killer virus out, outbreak spreads through New Jersey. It doesn't look like it, but we're dealing with another legalism. Where was the outbreak? What was the cause here? I don't know. Uh, very interesting. But where was the outbreak? In a government licensed facility. I mean, this is almost so much if the, so, so who cares that the mother killed the baby after birth if they're going to kill kids underneath licensed facilities in New Jersey for so-called viruses. We talked a little bit about this story. It's making, it's getting worse, folks, this, this, this outbreak. Health officials have confirmed that the, the ninth child has now died from deadly virus outbreak in New Jersey that originated in Passaic County Healthcare Facility. The, the, 
the incongruity between the view of the mother, the mother being culpable to the death of a ch- of a her her baby daughter before it was a baby a person it wasn't a baby you never talk about the baby it's a person see it's a legal fiction subject to the decision of a third party and if you treated your sons and daughters as your property maybe that would start to to wean them off if you stopped having your marriage the product of your marriage be subject to the state maybe that might be an under- indication go read your marriage license in the laws of the state folks what institution did you create that you're now only in custody to your own offspring you did it to yourself you created these uh, these persons these uh, US citizens these US persons so health officials now are, uh, there's something Running rampant through healthcare facilities in New Jersey, we reported on this. But they're given license. To me, I don't. There's not much here uh, to really look at. What's the culpability anywhere then? But this has another ominous thing because they're only hitting the frail, and these are these clinics are taking care of. Why did it start? Why did it start there? There's a whole other looking, a uh, whole other investigation that has to go on. Is this as sinister as an experiment going on? Is this just what the Norwegian doctor found out? They're using antibiotics too much, and all you have to do is going back to the good old uh, days of uh, non-antibiotic use and and just sanitation, folks. Clean up the place, a little bit of elbow grease. Anyway, there's a serious thing going on in New Jersey. It's making the news. Some more more children dead, died, but their uh, their weakened immune system. And then we find out your vaccines weaken your immune system. Let's go down that road if we want, or we can be quiet about it. All right, we have the we have all the facts. If we would just step up for it, new study again links fluoride to ADHD in children. ADHD is one of the most common issues in children these days, according to 2016. Data, 2016 data, the CDC approximately two of uh, this from the CDC, approximately 2.4 million children, 2.4 million children, ages 6 to 11, have ADHD in the U.S. and that number tends to increase over time. Just tends, seeing as though it's very hard to treat and affects so many kids. Wouldn't a better solution be to prevent it altogether? Nice question. So, another story, for those of you who want to get on the fluoride side of this, another study shows up, we got a problem. You can pick it up, you can use it as evidence. Hold it up against the administrative position that they have, go in when they go and find a wrong decision, they're holding a wrong opinion, reopen that part by interjecting yourself with these facts. I mean, my mind starts to wander, is the ADHD with the vaccines or their combination of, of uh, these toxic chemicals coming together like a binary weapon? I don't know. Conjecture. The point is there's a study now. We need studies. Here's another study. We have evidence that the studies that we may be getting may be late, way late, because they don't show up. Maybe they don't quite, uh, they don't get favor within the scientific community that's all beholden to the money they get for grants from the government. The same one that licenses the system to prevent, to present itself as something uh, um, beneficial. The same system that won't recognize a baby uh, in the mother's womb, and I don't agree with it, that she would be culpable of that tragedy. She shouldn't have been doing what she did. That's the price you pay for being, well, I'm not gonna, the Darwin Awards uh, worked uh, pretty quickly there. Don't like to hear it. I don't know what more to do about it. That's people making their decisions. They haven't been taught, they haven't been raised right somehow, or they've been affected after the fact. And we can find all the causation for that. All sits in the licensing of the condition, keeping you ignorant all the time. But keep on, we keep on talking about it instead of doing things for it and try to work toward it. Those of us that have a knowledge of it, uh, those of us that may feel. Uh, that we need to help, that we'd argue amongst ourselves instead, of learn how the process is to get reintegrate how this thing works. That sometimes these studies are late in coming because the system is self-protecting. That's why science has not gone anywhere. And you come up with a new idea, and they want to they want to beat you down because uh, you don't have any proof behind it. And yet you, they have all the wrong idea, and this is evidence here. So these studies, they're coming late. You got to, I wanted to have people look at that. They're coming late because there's an obstruction in the system over that. Why? Because the obstruction in the system that points the system out is, is not conducive to the system, is it? And here we have a little evidence of that. And take 
take stock in this one because this is an interesting little story about we've heard about an Alzheimer plaque on the brain and, and the, the since the, like the 80s they've been thinking that Alzheimer finding Alzheimer plaque was the cause some scientists with a different thought in his brain had a different idea an Alzheimer how an outsider bucked prevailing Alzheimer theories and clawed for validation Robert Mo Mo Moyer Moyer Moyer, I guess it is, Moyer, was the damned if he did and damned if he didn't. The Massachusetts General Hospital neurobiologist had applied for government funding from his Alzheimer's, for his Alzheimer's disease research and wildly, received wildly disparate comments from scientists tapped to assess his proposal's merits. It was an unorthodox hypothesis that might fill flagrant knowledge gaps, wrote one reviewer, but another said that the plan worked, the plan to work might add to uh, little to what is currently known. A third complained that although Mo Moyer, Moyer uh, wanted to, to study whether microbes might be uh, involved in causing Alzheimer's, no one had proved that was the case. As if scientists are supposed to study only what's no already known, an exasperated Moyer thought that when he when he read the reviews two years ago, he just had a paper published in a leading journal providing strong data for his idea that meta-amyloid, a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, might be a response to microbes in the brain. If true, the finding would open up vast, vastly different possibilities for therapy than the types of the compounds virtually everyone else was pursuing. Folks, he looked at this amyloid plaque. He said, it's in all animals. Nature by evolutionary principles, if we go there, it's in all animals. I don't know how you do the design versus the evolution if it's all always all there. What you know what's the purpose? But he said there's a purpose. It's in all animals, even if they're not sick. And he looked at it and said, That's not the cause, that's the response. What his findings show, and we they're still studying on this, he finally gets through and over years and years finally gets the money to move this process along. His idea there's viruses in our body that get into the brain that the brain's defense mechanism is to make an, a sticky tar, if you will, to capture and destroy the viruses there. In other words, like herpes and what they call HIV. That there's a virus that gets inside the brain, that the amyloid plaque is the evidence of a virus. That the scientific community, the licensed people that are supposed to be looking and be called scientists, would obstructed him for years before he would get enough energy, uh, money energy to do the study to show he might be likely right and the entire science is wrong. This is the best science that you now have your policies and administrative side working on, which I want you to start to look at this case and say, how do we know the, the people that are inside the system aren't obstructing good science? The best science is being withheld and that's a fraud by omission that we can't even know. And part of the uh, theory here, if it's a theory, look what it does to the existing system that's already been involved and invested in for decades that's false. Where does all that go? Oh no, we'd rather do uh, fusion technology, heat fusion uh, technology instead of figuring out what's really going on. Put Dump a bunch of money in that. Just keep dumping money and it's really not the, uh, the way we need to go. So many scientists are getting the idea uh, that we got to uh, support the system of education. We've got to protect our protection. The big protection society government does when it's running bad. It's up to us to change that, folks. Can't do it being quiet. Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, remember, thank you for what you do at reallibertymedia.com and all y'all that are mi uh, mirroring and uh, setting up the system uh, of social control, you know, social control interference and wayfaring. I appreciate all you do to send the, out the broadcasts uh, infect the mind of people become our own amyloid plaque to protect people, I don't know I'll talk with you next week Tech Diffs or Nature Willing Well that's another lesson I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave from behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony till next time, Journey with Purpose
that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, I just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. 